W5. I was suspended for a month without pay. Risking it all to do the right thing. I don't think anybody in power really wants whistleblower protection. What has the fallout been for you? It was out of a job. This law is a fraud. And it is a crucial final step in deconstructing the vestiges of colonialism. Is the monarchy still relevant in these modern times? I think it's just a huge mess. Monarchy is not appropriate for Canada in the 21st century. I shall continue to take the greatest pride in being your queen. Here is Avery Haynes. Welcome to W5. Whistleblowers are often hailed as heroes for standing up and doing the right thing, exposing corruption, crimes, and wrongdoing. But a W5 investigation reveals that this country has one of the worst international reputations when it comes to protecting whistleblowers. Tuesday, I'm driving up to Hamilton to work, and I just started getting like this eerie feeling. I'm thinking, okay, something's going on, like something big's about to happen. And I get on site, and there's an inspector on the way. So I thought, okay, here we go. Nurse Ashley Jenkins had no idea that a split second decision she made that day inside this retirement home would save lives, but kill her career. A lot of the times when people are whistleblowers, they have thought long and hard of the decision to become one. They've weighed the pros and the cons. I pretty much became one in the span of about 15 seconds. Rewind to May 2020, the height of the first wave of the pandemic. This private retirement home, the Roslyn, a 64-bed residence, was the site of Hamilton's worst COVID outbreak, with a death toll that accounted for more than one-third of all COVID deaths in the city. News footage captures what was, at the time, the unthinkable. The entire home had to be evacuated after almost every single resident and 22 employees became infected with the virus. Three days after the evacuation, Ashley was hired, oblivious to what she was walking into. I was under the impression that I was being brought in to manage a retirement home. I wasn't aware of the extent or the extreme level of crisis that they were in. So you walk in on your first day expecting to see residents of the nursing home. Instead, you see empty rooms. Correct. All of the residents of the home had been evacuated to two Hamilton area hospitals, and that that's where they were to stay until the home was sanitized, brought up to par. It turned out that bringing the home up to par was Ashley's job. With a decade of nursing experience, she had been hired as a co-manager of the facility. You walked into a hellhole. Yep, yeah, it, it reeked of urine, feces, and sweat. That wasn't even the worst of it. Ashley says there were bed bug and rodent infestations. There was no pandemic plan, limited PPE, incomplete or non-existent medical records. And then Ashley claims she was told to get the facility ready for the return of residents in five days. I was yelling and saying, you know, there's something horrifically wrong and I don't understand why it's gone unchecked, you know, for so long. How did they respond to that when you said that this place is not ready? The Roslyn said something to the effect of, well, if we can't get residents back in here by the first day of June, we can't cash the June rent checks, therefore you will not be paid. None of the staff will be paid. And then the final straw. Ashley says she and another employee were told to lie to a health inspector. The operations manager looked at me and said, the inspector's gonna ask for charts or documentation if anything's missing or if the documentation seems illegitimate, shady, not filled out, then 
we were asked to tell the inspector that those documents must have gotten mixed up in the kerfuffle of the resident transfer to the hospital. When you hear that from your boss, mm -hmm. hide the evidence that makes us look bad. What are you thinking? I stood up and I walked out of her office. I went out to call the Retirement Home Regulatory Authority. You called them to say, I'm leaving the property. I called them to tell them I was blowing the whistle, yeah. What has the fallout been for you? So I whistle blew on a Tuesday and by Friday I was out of a job. As Ashley would soon find out, Canada is one of the worst countries in which to be a whistleblower. If Canada is going to have a whistleblower law, they need to do it right. Tom Devine is the legal director of the Washington-based Government Accountability Project. It examined whistleblower laws in 61 countries around the world and ranked them on their ability to protect whistleblowers like Ashley. We think of whistleblower laws as shields. Uh, and, you know, if you go into battle with a metal shield, it's uh, dangerous, but you've got a fighting chance to survive. How well are Canadian laws shielding whistleblowers? Well, it really couldn't be much worse. Canada's law is weaker than a cardboard shield, more like a paper tissue shield. Out of the, the 61 nations that we checked, Canada tied for last with Lebanon in terms of just the rights on paper. Tied for last behind dozens of countries, including Britain, Pakistan, Japan, Bangladesh, and Botswana in a point system of 20 different factors. Among the criteria, the ability to report problems safely within a company, protecting identities when it comes to confidential disclosures, the guarantee of not being worse off than before blowing the whistle. Canada got one out of 20, and the only one they received was um, for promising to review the law. But a promised five-year review didn't happen for a decade. So really, Canada got zero out of 20. You were being incredibly kind and generous to give that one point. If the law were honest, they'd get zero out of 20. This law is a fraud. The law he describes as a fraud came into effect in 2007 to much acclaim. And never before has there been a government willing to take an initiative and bring forward a law so dramatic on accountability, and it's working. But in the ensuing 15 years, the law has been largely ineffective at protecting whistleblowers. There's only been six cases that have made it through the bureaucratic gauntlet to actually have a day in court. And out of those six cases, there were two decisions. The whistleblowers lost both of them after waiting years and years and years to lose. In 2017, a series of amendments was tabled to speed up the process and toughen the law. It was unanimously approved by a parliamentary committee. But critical amendments that could have protected whistleblowers like Ashley have not been enacted. She takes us back to where her world unraveled, the Roslyn in Hamilton, Ontario. I guess this is strange for you to come back into this, right? Yeah. To look at this? It's where my career suicide took place, so at least I'm still alive and breathing and I didn't catch COVID while working here. 16 residents of this home died from COVID. The survivors never returned to the facility, described in the local newspaper as a house of horrors. It was shut down after Ashley blew the whistle. It remains closed to this day. Not only was the Roslyn closed down, but health inspectors revoked the licenses of six other homes owned by the same company. The family that owned the chain has now sold off its properties. You were hailed a hero for whistleblowing. Mm -hmm. People talked about the fact that you likely saved lives. What do you think would have happened had you not whistleblown? Absolutely, 100%. There would have been loss of more life. The temp agency that had hired Ashley fired her almost immediately. In a statement to local media at the time, they cited trust issues. Ontario Premier Doug Ford praised her and said the law would protect her. There's a law, a whistleblower protection, and all she was doing is doing her job. If she saw a problem, good for her. I congratulate her. We'll find her a, a place in about a heartbeat. He didn't find her a place in a heartbeat. 
I'm pretty much blackballed uh, from the retirement home industry. If I showed you the sheer number of jobs I've applied to since June 2nd of 2020, you'd be astounded. A ballpark? Close to, if not over, 1,500. You've applied to well over 1,500 jobs in your field, mm -hmm. and no one will hire you. Because mm -hmm. they either see me as a rat, or you know they think that I want to come in and make waves. Whistleblowing has left Ashley unemployed and broke, but not broken. I know that I wouldn't be able to sleep at the end of the night if I had in any way thought I contributed to the loss of life in the 15 seconds that it took me to decide to become a whistleblower, I still wouldn't have done it differently. Coming up. I find it disgusting. When no good deed goes unpunished. I feel there's still a target on my back. When W5 continues. In the face of danger, Ian Fiddler knows how to handle himself. I work for the Nuclear Response Force at Chalk River. So it's a tactical response team, and we provide security for the site. Chalk River is a village 150 kilometers northwest of Ottawa. It's home to Canadian Nuclear Laboratories, a site focused on research and development of nuclear technologies. This site is so secure, it has a double fence perimeter and an ominous warning about armed surveillance. Access is strictly controlled. But this recruitment video offers a rare bird's eye view of the facility and a glimpse into the defense weaponry. Join our team. Join our team. Join our team. You're part of an elite security force responsible for protecting some of the most dangerous materials on Earth. That's a big job. Why are you pausing so much when I ask you that? I'm thinking about every word that I say. I don't want to in any way compromise my job already more than I already have. Ian guards his every word. He believes he has already compromised his job because of this. This is the video that launched all of this. How old's the boy you come to have sex with? You come to have sex with a 13-year-old boy? Ian isn't the person getting caught on camera. That's not even his voice you're hearing. Are you going to deny it now? Because we got all these recorded phone calls. I got all the chats. Got you admitting everything. The voice belongs to one of Ian's colleagues at the Chalk River facility. His name is Dave McAvoy, and he had a controversial hobby. Dave would pose as children online and then record his meetups with alleged pedophiles. On this night in 2019, Ian decided to join him. Do you think it's uh, OK to have sex with 13-year-old children? This man thought he was meeting a young boy for sex. And when Ian learned he worked at the Chalk River nuclear facility, his top tier security training kicked in. My first concern was that he'd put himself in a position to compromise his security clearance. And by that I mean he put himself in a position of blackmail. When did you realize, you know, I gotta tell the people at work that we have a potential security breach here? It was right away. And it was the first thing I did when I went to work on Monday morning is reached out to set up a meeting to discuss with the proper people what had just transpired. As you'd expect, the company launched an investigation. But not into the employee caught on camera. Instead, the focus was on Ian and his co-worker Dave, who had captured two other employees of the nuclear facility in his so-called creep catcher stings. The investigation was about uh, six weeks. Dave was terminated and I was suspended for a month without pay. Dave McAvoy fired. Ian suspended, all while trying to protect the community from an alleged pedophile and protect a nuclear facility from potential blackmail. It seemed to me like the priority was to just get rid of the, this whole issue because this was the third pedophile that had been exposed or caught in a sting 
and it seemed like their priority was just to eliminate the disruption in the workplace caused by reporting these people. Ian is the president of one of the unions at Chalk River, and he immediately filed a grievance over his suspension. It went to arbitration and took almost two agonizing years to be heard. It caused so much stress on my personal life. I've been on prescription sleeping pills. I haven't slept properly in a couple of years now. I was married and separated within, within the time that this process played out. You believe your marriage fell apart because of this? I believe that the stress that this caused on my personal life deeply affected my relationship. With his union behind him, Ian's arbitration hearing lasted 10 days. And by the end of it, vindication for Ian. The arbitrator ruled that he had a duty to report what he knew, that he suffered significant consequences, and that the disciplinary action was not appropriate. The ruling did, however, reprimand Ian for not being fully honest with investigators when asked if he had shown the video to colleagues at work. What was it like when this all came down for you? Um, I felt relieved and felt like I was exonerated. His colleague, Dave McAvoy, paid the highest price. He didn't have the powerful position that Ian did as a union president. He never got his job back, but he did reach a settlement with the company. W5 wanted to speak to Dave, but as part of that settlement, he had to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Dave has essentially been silenced. So what are the consequences? And what do you know about what's happened to the man that's in this video? My understanding is he still works at CNL and he was just moved to a different campus. How does that sit with you, Ian? I find it disgusting that he was never investigated. He's never even been spoken to by the company. Their whole focus was on us for reporting it. W5 requested information about Ian's case and the alleged pedophile. But in a statement, Canadian Nuclear Laboratories responded that they do not discuss details related to an individual's employment. They add, we take seriously the safety and security of our employees and communities, and that CNL does not support vigilante justice by creep catchers. While Canada ranked dead last in a study of whistleblower laws in 61 countries, legal director Tom Devine says it's stories like Ian's that highlight a greater issue. The weak laws that do exist are only for public servants and don't extend to private citizens like Ian. Canada is one of the few countries in the world that has a national whistleblower law limited to the public sector uh, and this sort of um, you know, gut-wrenching type of misconduct um, that you end up being victimized for exposing uh, couldn't be a better example of the need for that reform. Uh, Mr. Devine, I understand that uh, you are with us now from Washington. Tom Devine appeared at this parliamentary committee five years ago, chastising the Canadian government for not reforming the law. Uh, there has been no significant corrective action in over a decade with this law. In 2017, this committee unanimously approved tough new amendments, but key recommendations have not been implemented. Devine lays the blame squarely at the feet of the Prime Minister. Yes, he's been the primary obstacle blocking uh, an overhaul of Canada's whistleblower law. So what's the motivation of a prime minister in a country like Canada to stop whistleblower protection laws from being robust? Well, Mr. Trudeau has had his own scandals about uh, corruption and abuses of power, and a whistleblower law would have made it um, a little bit easier to funnel evidence uh, of his alleged misconduct. You're painting a very sinister motivation of the prime minister that somehow he's looking after his own backside uh, because he's embroiled in corruption scandals. Well, I don't want to be unfair and not a fly on his wall, uh, but that's what happened. Um, we were rolling towards um, uh, uh, an upgrade of Canada's whistleblower law, a real comprehensive makeover. Uh, he was elected. Everyone was optimistic. He killed it. And then a few years later, I could understand why, because he was facing scandals of his own. Scandals like these. A Liberal leader Justin Trudeau facing new questions about the SNC-Lavalin affair. I did not want her to lie. I would never do that. 
a half million dollar agreement given to the We Charity Group, which does have connections to both the Prime Minister and the Finance Minister. Ethics Commissioner Mary Dawson found Trudeau in violation of the Conflict of Interest Act. I should have taken precautions and cleared my family vacation and dealings with the Aga Khan in advance. I'm sorry I didn't. W5's request for an on-camera interview with the Prime Minister was denied. Instead, we received a statement saying the Government Accountability Project report does not paint an accurate picture of the approach taken in Canada, which is complicated, they claim, by limitations on Parliament's ability to impose federal whistleblowing laws on municipalities and provinces. At a weekly press briefing, we asked the Prime Minister directly about allegations that he has been apathetic because of his personal scandals. As a government, we have consistently uh, stood up for openness and transparency and brought forward uh, reforms that have supported people coming forward to highlight uh, wrongdoing uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in workplaces uh, or institutions across the country. We will continue to do just that. Despite the slew of headline-grabbing scandals, Canadian whistleblower advocate David Hutton, a senior fellow at the Centre for Free Expression in Toronto, says the only way laws will be beefed up is if the public demands it. I don't think anybody in power really wants whistleblower protection. If you look at other countries, it's generally come into being because of enormous pressure caused by successive scandals, for example. What you're saying is we're not going to have proper whistleblower protection unless there's a whole lot of pressure based on scandals that happen. Yeah, now we have no shortage of scandals, but we just don't have the pressure because the public has not got sufficiently angry about it or not made the connection that these could be prevented if whistleblowers had protection. Ian Fiddler is still working as an elite security guard at the nuclear facility in Chalk River. His career has survived, but he fears he's now a marked man. I feel there's still a target on my back. I feel like people will hold back and hesitate from reporting wrongdoing in the future or a security threat in the future because they've seen what happened to me. And if it can happen to me, it can happen to anybody. To read the full report from the Government Accountability Project, go to our website, w5.ctvnews.ca.